Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, the second panel of our Media Freedom in the Commonwealth conference. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Rita Payne, the uh, Emeritus President of the Commonwealth Journalists Association, uh, to chair this session and introduce our speakers. Rita, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, hello and welcome um, to all our eminent speakers, as well as um, the audience around the world. And before I even start, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Philip Murphy and Dr. Sue Onslow from the Institute of Commonwealth Studies for this amazing initiative, which is important, much needed, when uh, the media is under pressure from all sides. Um, and each of our speakers, we're looking at South Asia, um, has played a huge role, very, very influential in the media, not only in their countries, but in the whole region. Um, we'll be looking today uh, at this session at South Asia specifically, and it's quite disheartening to see that in the World Press Freedom Index, the, and how low down in the list these countries are. For example, Bhutan is the best at 67, Nepal is next 112, Afghanistan is ranked 122, Sri Lanka 127, India 142, Pakistan 145, and Bangladesh 151. These are 180 countries. So in the course of our discussion, I hope that we'll get an idea from you as to why you think conditions so bad, how it's affected you, and how things can be improved. And of course, we also want to look at good practice, and we'll, this will all be in the framework of context of the Commonwealth. So we have with us, uh, who will be taking part in this discussion, Rajiv Sardesai, who is an Indian news anchor, multimedia journalist and author. He is a consulting editor at the India Today Group and is an anchor for India Today Television. There's much more I could say on all the speakers, but I think we want to give them time to give their views, but do Google them because they are all impressive and they are true rounded Renaissance people who seem to do everything at one time. Um, the next speaker will be Najam Sethi, a leading Pakistani journalist, businessman and television host, founder of the Friday Times and Vanguard Books, and Professor Daya Tusu, Professor of International Communication, Hong Kong Baptist University, formerly Professor and Co-Director of the India Media Center at the University of Westminster. Um, so I will uh, ask each of our guests, to, as I said earlier, to speak for a few minutes to the subject. So can I invite Rajiv Sadesai first to give your views on the situation in India and also give the regional context as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rita, for inviting me uh, and for that very kind and generous introduction to you and the Commonwealth Media Studies uh, group for inviting all of us. Uh, it requires Zoom to connect India and Pakistan in the turbulent times in which we live. Uh, you know, the, the line of control sadly remains uh, as frozen as ever. So that is a added benefit. But just to bring together a South Asian community, I think it's important, not just India, Pakistan, but all the countries of South Asia. We just don't talk to each other as often as we should. So thank you very much. Uh, when we pose this, you know, I, I always look at India as a 50-50 country. I guess we should look all at all our countries as 50-50 countries. And it would be nice to look at the glasses half full and talk about the fact that India has more 24 by 7 news channels than any other country in the world. The fact that we have a lots of vibrant young online sites that are emerging. The fact that we have more newspapers and news dailies than any other country in the world. That would be giving the sense of a, of a media revolution that's taking place. But I'm afraid this is a revolution that has devoured its own. And therefore, one must look at this as the glass half empty rather than the glass half full. And I think the, in the context of the debate or the discussion over the next hour and a half, I think we need to look at four buckets, particularly in the context of India, but they could just as be, uh, you know, they could resonate as much in other countries in the region. The first is what I call, and I referred to this in my 2019 election book, as the rise of the elected autocrats. I think we are seeing at the national level, and indeed in Indian states as well, the rise of uh, authoritarian leaders 
who get elected through the ballot box and then proceed to use that political mandate to crush all forms of dissent and then use the instruments of the state in that regard. Now, that could be the police, it could be the enforcement directorate, all of which are used in a way to crush all forms of dissent. So both in New Delhi and in importantly in the state capitals, we do have increasingly one man and one woman political leaderships that seem to view the media as some kind of an enemy figure and then uh, believe that the media must fall in line or else and use the law enforcement machinery ruthlessly to settle scores. So you have numerous instances in the last few years of journalists being arrested even for Facebook posts, for tweets that they put up, often on non-bailable provisions, making it even more difficult for the journalists to get personal liberty. So I think the rise of these elected autocrats and the mandate that they get from the people almost legitimizes their actions in crushing all forms of dissent. And the media has been the victim, both at the state and the central level. The second important aspect that sometimes I think gets ignored is the collapse of the business model of the news media in general. I think as the media gets commodified, I think spaces for independent media are shrinking because the dependence on revenues in particular, on the government, on states, and on corporate power is increasing. We've seen more and more news channels being taken over by corporates uh, with uh, only a passing refer, uh, you know, a, a, a pa passing interest that they have really in the media or in values of media freedom. They take it over for uh, simply reasons of expanding their power, uh, both again at the regional level and the national level. And I think because uh, media networks and newspapers are now increasingly so dependent on government revenues, government advertising, the capacity of media to hit back or indeed protect themselves from the creeping state power or creeping corporate power it has shrunk beyond measure. You've got uh, a, a number of online sites emerging, but they don't have a business model in place. You've got television channels, which are all chasing a very limited advertising pie now, and you've got print, which is clearly in many parts in decline. So I think shrinking revenues and a collapsing business model in South Asia and indeed across the world in some way are undermining notions of media freedom. I think the third aspect that we need to look at is the enfeebling of institutions. My sense therefore is that whether it's broadcaster councils, whether it's press councils, whether it's the courts, and again, this refers both to district level courts, as well as unfortunately, even the Supreme Court of India. Uh, the fact is that the courts are no longer pushing back. They no longer are spaces where one can go to when media freedoms are under threat. Uh, the last named, I think the fact that the Supreme Court uh, is also succumbing is particularly worrisome. When sedition cases and increasingly sedition, a law that was uh, you know, brought in colonial times to, to jail the likes of Mahatma Gandhi are increasingly used against journalists for their anti-establishment writing. And then when courts do not give you relief for months on end, I think it reveals infirmities in the system and it's selective justice. If you're a powerful, well-connected journalist, you can get instant bail, as we saw recently in the case of a television anchor. But if you're less known, if you come from the margins or the periphery of the country, you could languish in jails for months on end. And we've also seen that happen in India. Journalists from smaller states spend weeks and months on, uh, in jail uh, and often don't get any uh, uh, support from the judicial system. So I think that is another crisis point in a way for the Indian media. And the fourth, I think, is again a point that we don't pay enough attention to, but I do hope we look at it because I think this is happening again across national boundaries. And that's the polarization of society as mirrored particularly in the growth of social media. To my mind, uh, the reasons why the political leaderships of countries increasingly believe they can get away uh, with impunity, with sort of uh, targeting journalists is because there's an element of consent and that consent is coming from an increasingly polarized society, which believes that shooting the messenger is fair game. And we are seeing that particularly on social media, where journalists are the targets of IT cells of political parties, and dare I use the word, they're stormtrooping gangs. You know, the Gauri Lankesh case, a case of a journalist activist, the manner in which her death was celebrated on social media by people who were followed by the Prime Minister of India. 
the Prime Minister of India followed Twitter handles who actually celebrated the death of a journalist. And we've seen that happen again. We've seen union ministers in India call journalists prostitutes and get away with it. We've seen them virtually uh, act as part of this sort of hectoring, haranguing mob which exists on social media. So I think when you get, when journalists start getting, and they are getting, I have got them, death threats via Facebook. When society becomes a cheerleader for these ideologies that peddle hate, the space I believe for reasoned opinion is shrinking. So I think we've got to look at this as a, a multi-pronged attack today on the spaces that are available to cherish the freedoms that we believe in and also ensure democratic accountability. The four that I mentioned, just to reiterate at the end, is the rise of the elected autocrat, the leader who believes he can get away, he or she can get away with impunity, the collapse of the business model of news media that is making us more dependent on political authority, the enfeebling of institutions that could offer some kind of checks and balances, and the worst of all, according to me, the deep polarization of our society, which is legitimizing this form of, uh, of hate speech, of violence against the media, which effectively suggests that we are being now pushed into the corner where rather than offer a mirror to society, we're being asked to become uh, 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 foot soldiers of uh, the armies of our political leadership. So I think, I think these are troubled times. Uh, would be an understatement. I believe that uh, these are the worst of times, sadly, uh, is, is what I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajdeep. That was very clear, very powerful. And the four points that you mentioned, I'm sure that you know other speakers will agree with you. I think that applies to other countries as well in varying degrees. <laughs> now, um, I've um, uh, you know known um, Najam from my old BBC days. And I remember, Najam, the times you were threatened at various governments, things have changed. And you've seen all sides of Pakistan of what it's like to be a journalist. Not only have you been a journalist of a leading newspaper group, but you've also, you're an anchor, but you were also in government for a while. You are also chair of the Pakistan uh, Cricket Association body. Um, so you've seen everything. So first of all, could you describe what it's been like for you being targeted? What's, do you still get threats and where do they come from? Thank you, Rita. Um, Philip, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure being here on this panel with you to share some of our experiences and try and find a way forward. Yes, you're right. I've been in the media now since the late 80s. And I've seen it all. I've been a federal minister for a few months in an interim government. I've been the chief minister of Punjab for a few months, holding elections. I've edited a weekly paper, a daily paper, an Urdu paper. I've been an anchor, and so on. So I've been on the inside, and I've been on the outside. More, more, more on the outside than I've been on the inside. But I can tell you what happens on the inside, because I'm sure a lot of you know what happens on the outside. Uh, I mean, my experience um, uh, of two cabinets is that the first item on every cabinet's cabinet meetings agenda is the media has said this and the media has said that. How do we deal with the media? Um, and it came as a shock to me that this is so important to every cabinet member in terms of what the media says and what the response of the cabinet or of the government should be. And invariably, it's anger, outrage, and attempts to silence it by threats or by other means. Uh, so I've seen it uh, from the inside. And it's not a pleasant situation when you're in, uh, when every member of the cabinet is talking about the media and saying how terrible the media is and how unfair it is and how something ought to be done. The long and short of it is that in the old days, it used to be, how do you manage the media? You manage it by threats and by bribes. I think that era, at least in Pakistan, is over. You don't manage the media anymore. I think the philosophy is, how do you control the media? Uh, the government now, because of uh, terrible economic conditions, 
the governments don't really have much to offer by way of advertising and uh, other uh, benefits uh, to the media. So you, the, the media is on its own. Uh, the economy is shrinking, which means that uh, there's a lot of competition as well. On top of that, uh, all the conditions that Rajdi uh, identified are very much prevalent in Pakistan in more or less the same sort of order. Um, I will say this, that the Pakistani media has been corporatized in a slightly different way uh, um, from the Indian media in the sense that uh, in the old days, not so long ago, maybe 15 years ago, uh, most of the news, it was just the print media and most of the print media was owned by journalists. Uh, that's no longer the case. Um, it's now owned by uh, landlords, contractors, uh, defense contractors and others, um, and also by businessmen, and all of whom have very close ties with every government in power. Uh, so the owners now basically run editorial policy, uh, which means that uh, whatever little freedoms we had in terms of expressing independent opinions are, are on their way out. Uh, the net result of that has been that although there's a proliferation of electronic channels and newspapers, uh, there's very little independence uh, in terms of editorial writing, in terms of articles, in terms of reporting. Um, and this is a terrible thing because those of us who decided that we should hold our ground have actually lost our jobs. Um, for nearly 10 years, I was in the top uh, news channel of the country. And um, two years ago, um, they couldn't afford to have me saying the sort of things that I was saying. Uh, and so now, although five or six other newspaper channel, uh, uh, electronic channels approach me to come and be an anchor for them or to be an analyst for them, eventually they all pulled, uh, pulled out. Why? Because they received phone calls to say, no, you can't take this guy. Uh, and all of them backed out with the result that I no longer um, am available on a television network. I've had to go to YouTube. Um, and even on YouTube, I've ha I, I'm supposed to be very careful. Otherwise, they will uh, make all sorts of uh, charges and YouTube will start sending me notices, which I've received from time to time. Uh, the other interesting thing is that in the old days, um, the worst that could happen to you was that you might get a notice from one of the media, government media control organizations to say, well, you've said this or you've done this, explain, show cause, why action should not be taken against you and so on. But now it's very different. Now what happens is that you get death threats. Um, sometimes if you're really provocative, you tend to disappear. You tend to disappear for 10 days, 15 days, three years, three months. Uh, and then you appear and you're suitably chastened. Several of uh, my colleagues have had to leave Pakistan because they ended up disappearing for short periods of time. And when they came out, they were decided they wanted to leave the country. Um, and these are people who were basically on social media. They weren't even in, in, in the mainstream media. They'd been ousted from the main, mainstream media. The second thing is that we've had a, a lot of terrorism in our country, in the, um, especially from the uh, Taliban. And it was curious that um, sometimes we would get threats from the Taliban. Um, and you know, those are threats you don't take lightly. Um, I personally have received such threats myself and at least on two occasions in the last decade, I've had to leave Pakistan um, for a few months um, to try and calm down and to cool things off uh, and so on. And um, most of us uh, who can afford it, uh, go around in armored cars with guards. And it's not something with, that you can easily afford. Now, I don't think anybody in India goes around in armored car, cars, but we do, I do, uh, my family does. Uh, there was a time four or five years ago when I couldn't even go to the studio uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, for, to record my program. I had to set up a studio in my own house for a whole year. Uh, the DSNG van used to come to my house and we used to do the program from there. Um, so it's been pretty tough. And that continues to this date. Um, uh, and I fear that uh, things are getting worse. The point that uh, Rajdeep made about uh, majoritarianism and populism, I think that is right now the biggest threat. And if it comes along with a failing economy uh, or a government whose legitimacy is in doubt in one way or the other, as in Pakistan currently, uh, in terms of uh, how the government came into being, 
Um, such governments tend to be very sensitive and very aggressive. Um, and the interesting th thing is that such governments tend to have the back backing of the establishment. And by the establishment, I mean the military establishment. So you really don't, you never really know who's threatening you uh, and what is likely to happen if you end up saying certain things. And I mean, I could write a book on the sort of things that uh, the advice that we get in terms of what you can say and what you can't say. Or sometimes you don't get the advice, you simply end up saying things and then you find out that you shouldn't have said this or you shouldn't have said that. I'll give you just one example. Um, the channel that I was working with uh, six months ago, it's closed down now, uh, but the um, but I happened to say a few things uh, that were not appreciated um, and they shut down the channel. Uh, they just pulled the plug on the channel. Um, so now we have various mechanisms in Pakistan to control the media. And I must tell you that in all these years, uh, from print media to electronic media, now to um, YouTube, uh, this is the toughest period uh, that I have experienced in all our years in journalism. There's very little... Um, tolerance for the free press or for dissent. Um, and as I said, uh, they don't think of it as management anymore. They say media is the problem um, and we need to control the media. And by control, it mean, they basically mean uh, they're not going to allow you to say um, anything of any significance. My personal problem has been that I'm not really an anchor. Um, I used to have a program where I was asked my opinion on various things that were happening in Pakistan. And, um, and so I used, so, it, so, the, so the program was dependent on, the, on my ability to do two things. Number one, to speak the truth as far as possible. Otherwise, why would anybody want to hear my opinion about what's happening? And also then to make predictions about what was likely to happen, um, which of course, in, you know, my experience in government gave me some insights. Um, and of course, my sources and uh, in the establishment and in the government. Um, and every time I use th that information to analyze what was going on, uh, it used to go against me. Um, um, I used to feel the brunt of uh, the management, not management control uh, paradigm uh, from Islamabad. So, uh, and last, uh, what I'd like to say is this, that for a long time, we in Pakistan who've had been through military rule and um, uh, sometimes um, autocratic rule under Democrats. Um, we used to look, look up to India uh, as a model of uh, free media uh, and a secular society. And you know, our tragedy is we can no longer, frankly, clutch at, uh, at, at what is happening in India as, as self, shall we say, an example of the sort of things we would like to do. And this is very depressing because that used to be a great stick to beat our own people with. Let's look across the border, look how democratic they are, look, look at the sort of things that are happening there, uh, look at the creativity there, look at how free the media is there. We can't say that now. I mean, I'll close by simply saying that um, once or twice I've asked my colleagues in the Indian media to have a dialogue with me uh, or for me to interview them on something or the other about India. And they've been very reluctant because I suspect uh, nationalism bites very deep and nobody wants to be seen on, uh, on their home screens as being critical of their own country or of their own government. And in, the same thing is now happening in Pakistan. Uh, when Indian journalists call up Pakistanis uh, to discuss Pakistan with them, um, Pakistanis are reluctant. The rhetoric of nationalism, sub-nationalisms and nationalisms and populism and the India-Pakistan perennial problem has now in effect shut out all a dialogue between, uh, forget the governments, even between journalists uh, in India and Pakistan. So it's a pretty dismal situation. Thank you, Najam, for this very sobering assess assessment of what's happened to Pakistan. Um, and Rajiv, I was, uh, I was thinking that, you know, when I left India many, many years ago, um, people were very proud of the media. It was robust, it was independent, and you know, there were a whole range of outlets. How is it that that has been allowed to change and to reach this stage now? Whereas Najam says that, you know, even Pakistan can't look up to Indians and the Indian media as a model. You know, I, 
I think the rise of majoritarian nationalism or majoritarian populism and the fact that it's now got a popular mandate has necessarily meant that majoritarian nationalist governments or majoritarian ethno-nationalist governments, as some now call them, are constantly in search of an enemy. And one of the enemies that they looked at, uh, and I now looked at this uh, a, a few years ago, was the media. Uh, and uh, the media was therefore put in a position where they were told, either you toe the line and become propagandist channels, or you face the wrath of the state. And it was done, interestingly enough, in a more hidden, you know, it's more insidious now. Uh, you know, Indira Gandhi brought in the emergency and clamped down on the media in the mid 1970s. In the age of Mr. Modi and the elected autocrats in different states, you don't need an emergency anymore. You simply use your uh, 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 the the weapons available to you: the police force, the enforcement directorate, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the various police forces to target any journalist or any uh, media outlet, maybe which may be seen to be remotely anti government You see, that's the difference. The earlier there was a legal edifice almost uh, to, to this kind of, uh, to these kind of actions. Rajiv Gandhi tried to bring a defamation bill. Uh, uh, Indira Gandhi brought in the emergency. You don't need to do any of that now. You simply have, and, and what they, and because majoritarianism has, seeped in so deeply into society and society is polarized, so are newsrooms. I think one of the things we need to look at is that while we talk about our freedoms, with every freedom comes responsibility. Just look at the manner in which standards have fallen and media outlets and individuals and senior journalists at that are more than willing to capitulate. So when they capitulate, what do you expect younger people in the newsroom to do? So I think falling standards have uh, in, in a majoritarian setup uh, become so uh, uh, so deep and deeply entrenched now uh, this polarization uh, that the capacity I come back to it where is the cap the capacity comes when an independent media can withstand pressure how do I withstand pressure if governments of the day uh, will clamp down on advertising uh, which is a, a big source of revenue will actually go to corporates. I mean, I am amazed in recent times, there have been ministers who have written to corporates saying, do not put money, do not advertise on a particular channel. And they've written to MNCs saying that these channels are anti-national or this newspaper is, is a newspaper we would not like you to advertise in. Now, I think once that happens, once the rhetoric of nationalism takes over, uh, then it's very difficult to combat these forces. I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and all you can then do is perhaps set up your YouTube channel or, 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 you know, spaces where perhaps you hope that governments will not intervene. But now there are moves in India, at least afoot, to even have some kind of curbs on internet as well. I mean, that's the next step. That's the last frontier left. I mean, the hope was that technology will provide us some form of independence, but I don't know for how long. So I think, I think you know, that's the, the you asked, you know, why has there been no resistance? Who's going to support us? You know, at the end of the day, a robust civil society will demand a robust free media. But when civil society gets enfeebled or when civil society gets balkanized and polarized, it becomes more and more difficult. So I'm not trying to pass the buck. I think we in the media are also responsible for our own downfall. You know, when, as I said, when senior journalists succumb so easily to, to this form of pressure. You know, we now have the term news managers in a newsroom. You don't have editors anymore. You have news managers. And what does a news manager do? He or she has to manage the environment. And what does managing the environment mean? Ensure that whoever is in power, uh, you know, is, is kept reasonably uh, on, on the right side. So you're not telling truth to power. Instead, you're, you're succumbing to power. So I think there's a larger crisis in society and I think that crisis of society has meant that the media is no longer, no longer has the support of civil society. There's a consent. My biggest worry is there's a consent in civil society to the intimidation of the media. Yeah, I think you're right. We only have to look at even Trump and when he starts with fake news and as you say, talk That's of right. prostitutes. Uh, there is a loss of trust 
in the media. And later on, maybe we can try and explore what can be done. And also the concentration of media ownership came out earlier in the earlier discussion in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, do does the media, which we look at, do journalists just roll back and say, there's nothing we can do? Or are there any mechanisms, there anything collaboration, cross-regional, uh, can journalists work together? Maybe we can discuss all that later um, in this program, as it were. Um, now I'd like to invite Professor Dyer to Sue. Um, could you give us your perspective on media developments in South Asia and tell us in the course of it a bit of your, about your own research? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, especially Professor Murphy and Dr. Hassan. It's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be following on from two very distinguished uh, journalists whose work I know and admire. Um, <clears throat> I have been out of India for 30 years, um, well, more than 30 years, 32 years, after those 32 years, 30 years, but in the UK and for last year and a half, nearly two years, I've been in um, China and Hong Kong. And that gives you slightly more, um, I would say, nuanced view of what's happening in South Asia, because you have a comparative framework which looks beyond the, the India-Pakistan Tutu Meme kind of argument. Um, if you are here in Hong Kong or in mainland China, then you will say where well, Indian media is incredibly free, right, with all its many problems. Um, and um, Unlike these two gentlemen, I am not threatened. One of the great privileges of being in an academic job is that you are protected. Nobody bothers what you do. These guys are on television every day. They say is monitored and people send them all kinds of messages, not always pleasant ones. So I'm going to uh, really talk about three points and, and echo some, some of the points which already Rajdeep and Najim have already kind of referred to. Um, the first point I want to make about uh, what, why there is a problem with freedom of media is, is market itself, the excessive and accelerated marketization of media. Uh, not a specifically South Asia problem, but you know, it's a, it's a global problem, deregulation, liberalization, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at one level, this has provided extraordinary freedom uh, of, of, of different types of viewpoints, uh, the subalterns, the marginals now have access to information. Um, but it has also restricted the spectrum of opinion in the mainstream. So uh, many decades ago, when I was a PhD student in a university in South Delhi, which gets a very bad name uh, in, in, in current dispensation in Delhi, um, uh, by the way, from that university, uh, you have the finest foreign minister India could ever imagine, the guy with the most domain expertise and of any other foreign minister I can think of, with possible exception of the Russian foreign minister. Um, and you have the finance minister who comes from there and the person who has the um, Niti Ayog, which is the, the, the most serious uh, think tank in India, also has be educated there. So I don't understand why this, this university is being demonized, but that's a different discussion altogether. Uh, but in those days, from Panchajanya, which is a RSS newspaper, to Patriot, which was uh, now defunct left-wing newspaper funded by the Russians, there were a, like more than a dozen newspapers available in Delhi. And there was a kind of, this was pre-television age, uh, in, in satellite age, and there was, ex, you know, People are happy with that diversity. You can read an RSS paper or you can read CPM, ML kind of extreme left newspaper, and it was perfectly okay. Even in the mainstream, so if you ask somebody today, who is the editor of Times of India? I don't think you would know who the person is. When Girilal Jain was the editor and Shamlal was, everybody knew who these people were. So as Rajiv mentioned, these, uh, they are now managers, not editors. So, one big problem is this excessive marketization and how it has affected media as, as, as a public uh, kind of good, if you like. Um, Edward Herman, who um, some of you may know, um, who was a professor at, at Wharton Business School and uh, co-wrote that very famous book with Noam Chomsky called Manufacturing, Cons Manufacturing Consent. Um, he contributed to a chapter that I had uh, in, in my book, I edited it a long time ago, 1998. The book was called Electronic Empires. And he used this beautiful phrase. He said, 
you know, market is the KGB. Market controls everything. And I think uh, in the South Asian context, as in other contexts, that argument is very valid. So in a, in a place, for example, in India, where you have 400 plus uh, news channels, television news channels and counting, obviously the competition is fierce. So they will do everything possible to keep, keep the, the eyeballs. And we've seen the, the sort of defilement of um, public discourse. Uh, the, I mean, there are you know, kinds of words said on national television that I cannot uh, share with this, this audience. Uh, and that's on record. So, um, you know, that, that's one point I wanted to make. The other related point is then the this whole uh, populism, which has been mentioned by previous two speakers as well. And this is not a particularly Indian uh, or South Asian problem. You have in Hungary, in Philippines, in China, in, uh, you know, you could argue that um, the, the fact that uh, Mr. Uh, Trump became the president of the United States is, is an ultimate indication of the triumph of that kind of populism. A person who has no, who had no experience of public office. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan became president twice, but he was before that governor of, of California, which if it was a country, it would be like fifth largest economy in the world. Um, this gentleman had absolutely no experience of public office. His only claim to fame was a, a, a cheap uh, reality TV show, um, and he was elected. And, and as we know, if, if uh, the, the, the second term was also very, very kind of close. Uh, thankfully, um, as far as we know, he, he has lost. Um, so this populism also reflected something else, which is a disconnect between the elite media, the New York Times of the world, for example, in the US context, and the Trump constituency. You could also argue same thing happened in India. Uh, I mean, I monitor that more carefully because I'm working on a, uh, a book project. Uh, but see, for India, you need like three years to do proper research. It's such a complex system. Um, and there was actually the, the mainstream media was hostile to Mr. Modi without having an understanding that there might be a sociological shift which had already taken place, um, that there is a constituency which is waiting to be, uh, you know, to, for, to looking for that kind of a leadership. I remember distinctly uh, a, a, a um, seminar organized in a very distinguished uh, university in London just before 2014 election. And uh, it was very, you know, high, high profile uh, panel. And the assumption was that this is just kind of propaganda, this is propaganda, this guy is not going to win. Then the young guy from uh, a student raised his hand, he said, what if you guys are wrong? What if, he, if you, don't, you don't know what's happening there? Um, and then we saw that also in last year's election. And in fact, Rajdeep's channel did a, um, um, you know, opinion poll recently post COVID to find that if Modi was to elect, uh, go for election, he will win hands down. So there is that interesting um, disconnect between the, the dominant aspects of mainstream media and the ground realities. And I expect that's also true in other parts of South Asia. The final thing I wanted to say is uh, related to, um, which also I think Raj, Rajdeep mentioned, is this whole digital revolution. Uh, India has the largest open internet in the world because the Chinese one is not open. It has the largest population of Facebook as well as WhatsApp. Uh, we're talking about 400 million people and counting. And that has become a domain for all kinds of journalisms. Um, and it is impacting on mainstream in a manner that was unthinkable even five years ago. And uh, political parties, uh, businesses, uh, extremist groups, all kinds of stakeholders are using this in a region where demographics is very much suited to this generation. Uh, it's the largest number of young people on the planet. Um, if you look at the top 10 internet populations in the world, out of 10, three are in South Asia, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So this is a, a problem which is going to get worse. Um, the final thing I want to say in that context is that um, in, in, in our region in South Asia, despite 
much, much economic progress, um, it still is home to largest number of illiterate or semi-literate people. So there has been this extraordinary shift from semi-literacy or illiteracy to a visual culture, um, to a TikTok kind of culture. Uh, and that also has implications about, uh, you know, how does a, 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 a old fashioned legacy media deal with this new audience, which is used to 10 second, um, you know, video. And, um, and that is the future uh, customer, that the future voter, and that has uh, interesting has interesting implications for um, media more generally. Not, and I, I specifically mention South Asia because the numbers involved are so huge. I'll stop there uh, for for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Daya. It's interesting that you are in Hong Kong and you say the situation in India looks much better from where you are, mm -hmm. because you're also in a good position to talk about. Chinese influence, for example, um, you know, in Nepal, one journalist who died supposedly committed suicide, but people suspect that there might have, that China might have had a role, of course, there's nothing this is uh, confirmed, because he'd been critical about the extent of Chinese influence in Nepal. And so there's so do you think there's an China is sort of looking at trying to infiltrate media spaces in South Asia at the moment? I know in Pakistan, they've got a presence and maybe Najam can tell us about that. So if you want to say something very briefly, and then maybe I'll go to Najam to talk about the Chinese influence. Well, I, you know, I, I did a book a couple of years ago on uh, globalization of Chinese media. Um, and very recently, in fact, I had a lecture here on Chinese soft power, which was amazingly well attended on Zoom because they think, okay, this guy, a non-Chinese person talking about soft power of China, and an Indian at that because, we, as you know, we are, you know, having some trouble on border with them. Um, and also, some of you would know, in fact, one Indian journalist was arrested by Indian authorities, uh, claiming that he was working uh, with Defense Ministry in India and elsewhere, and passing on sensitive information to China. Um, I, to be very honest, I do not know the details, uh, how much Chinese influence there is in Indian media, I would suspect it's not very much. Its presence is very strong in the, you know, so think of mobile uh, internet. So 70% uh, of smartphones in India are still um, made by Chinese companies. And there's a lot of data, which <coughs> you may know, in, you know, India was the first country to ban TikTok which has largest audience in the world was in India. So in that space, there is Chinese presence, but Indian media is so very different from China. Chinese media remains, uh, you know, little more than government mouthpieces. Thankfully, despite what uh, Prince Rajdeep was saying, uh, you know, I read Indian media regularly and, th and there is, a, and, and I watch Indian media regularly and there is a kind of discussion and debate, which is inconceivable in China. So, you know, and that's a long history. You can't just expect that because there's a new Nizam in Delhi, there's a new system in Delhi, everything will change. It hasn't. And I don't think there's going to go away anytime soon because the, the, the although what I agree with was as in terms of institutions are being weakened, the, 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 the law is, you know, the, the, is becoming more intrusive in terms of uh, what journalists can and can't, can, can't do. But you know, you read stuff on, for example, national newspapers, which is very critical. And I don't know, Rajiv you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, th these editors are working normally; they have not been arrested. Um, in fact, the guy who was arrested was actually a, a very, uh, you know, uh, overtly uh, pro uh, Modi uh, journalist, probably the most overtly pro Modi journalist. So. Um, but as far as, I mean, and, and Najan could uh, enlighten us on that in terms of Pakistan and elsewhere. But again, I would suspect uh, in terms of media, I don't uh, expect too much uh, presence, maybe in infrastructure, obviously, uh, including communication infrastructure, but uh, media systems South Asia are very different. Um, yeah, the reason I asked this question is that um, I attended a webinar not so long ago about the global influence of China on the media, what it's trying to do. Because in contrast to what you've explained, advertising, money shrinking, and so on, 
China is apparently throwing money everywhere to try and build up its media influence uh, as a power, as a soft power. And Najam, is this something that you detect in Pakistan at all? No, not at all. And that's Good. interesting mm. because, you know, Pakistan and China have a very extraordinary relationship, which permeates not just uh, to the level of government to government, but also to the people. Uh, since uh, the U.S. walked out on Pakistan, uh, there's a lot of anti-Americanism in Pakistan, but by the same criterion, there's a lot of pro-Chinaism because China seemed to be your all-weather friend. China gives us military hardware now in place of the Americans. China has um, uh, military relations with our military. Um, there's some speculation about Chinese and other assistance in the development of our nuclear program, uh, missile program, and so on and so forth. So because it's a security state, or built as a security state, or an insecure state, um, China is, has a, a unique and exalted position in, 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 in Pakistan, I including in the people. I'm amazed there is absolutely no Chinese influence in our media. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is, of course, what I've explained. The other is that you will never find an anti-China article in our media. The Chinese don't need to do any public relationship with us. I mean, I know that it, even in the, during the best days of uh, uh, America-Pakistan relations, um, and including now an anti-America uh, sentiment, uh, the Americans were always very keen to establish a relationship with the Pakistani media, inviting them, giving them scholarships, touring, uh, getting them to tour the United States, uh, you know, USAID, uh, uh, Fulbright, and so on and so forth. Chinese have done nothing of the sort. I mean, you'll be shocked. I mean, I'm invited to every function uh, by any uh, high commissioner of uh, repute uh, in Islamabad because they're all trying to do their PR with us. The Chinese, A, don't invite anybody. They don't have functions uh, except on a particular national day or the other where they will only invite government functionaries. They have little to no interaction uh, with the Pakistani media. I mean, if you were to ask me who's the Chinese ambassador uh, in, in Pakistan, I wouldn't know his name. I mean, if that is how invisible they are. And yet, at another level, the Chinese influence, in, certainly in terms of its contacts with the military and also in, in terms of its uh, economic assistance, and now with CIPEC, it's huge. And yet, at the end of the day, the uh, situation is such that even the contracts that Chinese companies sign with Pakistani companies or the government-to-government -government contracts that are signed, the Chinese, one of the conditions is that the, these contracts will not be shown to the public. Uh, they will not be made public. Uh, in fact, the, one of the demands of the IMF uh, right now that is trying to give Pakistan some money is that you show us all your uh, uh, trade deals with China. We want to see what's happening. And uh, the Chinese have told the Pakistani government you can't do that. And so, you know, so that is how China is in Pakistan. It can't do any wrong. We don't talk about China. Uh, there's speculation about how China will always assist Pakistan whenever the need so arises. It's almost like what it was with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan 20 years ago. I mean, the Saudis could do no wrong. They were the great patrons, both of Islam and of economic assistance. And, um, and now that's not the case. We actually end up criticizing Saudi Arabia now. Um, and relations are not as good as they ought to be. Whereas with China, no such thing. China's supposed to be the friend that will come to your aid in the event there is a problem with India uh, along the border. Uh, this spec and that, from there it begins and ends. Because the whole preoccupation in Pakistan is India, and so therefore uh, China is your, uh, the one power that will bail you out. Uh, and uh, at every turn, uh, China has come to your aid and to your assistance. You know, just last thing, last point. The whole world talks about uh, what's happening to the Uyghurs. Uh, no one in Pakistan talks about it. And when you ask people, why don't you, you talk about Muslim, Muslims across the world and perhaps the injustices that are perpetrated on them, what, what is happening in China? And you know, the argument is we don't want to meddle in the internal affairs of China. It's as though uh, we cannot talk about anything that is right or wrong or wrong in China. Uh, so that is the, the situation in Pakistan. Thank you very much, Ajahn. Can, can I just uh, add, sorry, Rita, can I just add one little thing? I, uh, somebody yeah. put that information on chat that the Chinese are... Yeah, uh, I was just going to refer to... 
yes, which is ahead. which is a, a very very important point. So there's that kind of indirect involvement, uh, but I don't know whether that is reflecting on editorial pages, uh, or especially in the last few months. Is actually that's a been good question. The, the other extreme, in fact, to to the extent the other day I was on one of the Chinese uh, Chinese um, discussion panels, uh, one of their actually flagship programs. And they were talking about something as boring as their, uh, you know, 14 five year plan. I don't know why they invited me, but I was looking at the comments and they said, somebody said traitor Indian. I didn't mention India wasn't mentioned at all. I just was talking about 5G and how far ahead they are from the rest of the world. And, you know, so that is the level of kind of, um, you know, because of what happened in June and, and subsequent to that. So uh, so this Chinese involvement in uh, like advertising, I mentioned the whole digital space actually is uh, has been there for, for many years. And one final thing I would say about that is the Chinese are very pragmatic. So they don't want, you know, our area is not a priority for them. India probably for a market. And I think what they did in June was a serious mistake because they lost a generation of uh, Indian uh, consumers, uh, their focus is on number one country. They want to be number one country uh, by 2030. And what do you do? They, you go to to you, you go to U.S. and U.S. They have private radio stations which are funded directly by the by the Chinese government. They have, I mean, Freedom House did a report um, last year, which which you know put it in a great detail how 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 widespread that influence is. And you could see until recently in, in papers like New York Times and, Was and Washington Post and Wall Street Journal and the Telegraph in Delhi, London, uh, supplements from, uh, from China daily. Uh, you know, they okay. were just, and they were just, it's like all over the world, Sydney Morning Herald, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So they have been actually focusing on, on the so-called, you know, West and within that US. Uh, our area is not priority for them. Yeah, um, I won't, um, stick to this at home. It doesn't look as though it is that much of a factor for to South Asia. But um, Ragdeep, I've just someone has um, Aditya Sharma has just said that Chinese companies uh, pump crores uh, rupees in via ads in, in the Indian advertising industry. Is this a factor, or we don't need to dwell on it too much if you don't think this is relevant? No, I I, I don't think it's relevant. I mean, I, I right. mean, if you just have to see the kind of media commentary post the events that have taken place in April, May, to realize that I, I you know, I, I think it comes back to sort of the sense of of nationalism, of, of competitive nationalism means that there's only so much the Chinese can do in terms of influencing the media. I don't think they have any real uh, uh, significant stake in influencing the Indian media. No. Right, excellent. So that's something we can dismiss. Um, now, William Crawley would like to say a few words of Sri Lanka in the way of sort of talking about South Asia, making comparisons. So, William, do you want to say something now? Uh, yes, thank you. It's, uh, I'm sorry, we missed Kishale Pinto Jawadana, who would be the, the person to talk about the Sri Lankan experience. And uh, the reason why I wanted to say a few words is that uh, um, Sri Lanka is, of course, very much in the middle of um, uh, a constitutional amendment crisis at the moment. So uh, what I would like to do is just sort of raise some questions for comparison with uh, members of the panel of uh, Sri Lanka with other Asian countries. I mean, we know, I know that uh, um, Kishali Jawadna has stressed the extent to which media freedom is closely bound to constitutional circumstances in every country. Sri Lanka is currently in the middle of a constitutional tussle over the powers of the president. There's something of a swinging pend pendulum history here. That there were strong constitutional safeguards against an overmighty executive in Sri Lanka's original constitution, which was dilute, diluted by former President Jayawardena. In the past 10, within the past 10 years, they were, they were overturned by the 19th Amendment and are now being in the process of being restored by the 20th um, Amendment of the constitution. It's not a straightforward change. Uh, it, 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 it's not straight back to uh, a, a totally all-powerful um, presidency, executive presidency. The Sri Lankan Supreme Court seems to remain a powerful voice, but not as effective as it has been. The personal accountability of the president appears still to be subject to 
Supreme Court adjudication under the 20th Amendment, as it had not been uh, under the previous all-powerful executive presidency before the 19th Amendment. Um, uh, the other difference, I think, is that uh, on the majoritarian issue, which is very much a majoritarian government in Sri Lanka now, but uh, support from radical Buddhist similar nationalist organizations cannot at the moment be taken for granted. There is some pushback, uh, uh, even from uh, Buddhist similar nationalist organizations in Sri Lanka. And of course, this comes with a long history of anti-incumbent resistance uh, in uh, Sri Lanka over many decades, which has always acted as a, uh, and it could provide still some kind of a break on majoritarian excesses. Um, of course, Sri Lanka's history of uh, the uh, violence, violence against journalism is, uh, is uh, unequaled in other countries. 25 journalists were killed between 2005 and 2011, uh, many of them related to the civil war. Uh, the latest attack yesterday, uh, an attack on a Tamil journalist, apparently arose from his criticism of a Tamil organization, not a reprisal from Sinhalese quarters. I don't know whether that's uh, something to celebrate or not. Uh, but the other point of comparison that uh, I'd like to ask the panel about with other South Asian countries is the strength of the civil society presence and opinion in Sri Lanka. Even in the 30 years in Sri Lanka, which emergency powers overrode all normal safeguards and, and, and rights for the media uh, and for individuals, um, there, there, were, uh, there was strong expressions of opinion, which, which came, into, came into force again and still remains in force with with the resumption of, as it sadly turned out, temporary resumption, temporary resumption of media freedoms. Um, and Rajni Sadasai spoke of weaknesses in Indian civil society. And I would like to ask him um, where he thinks that those weaknesses in Indian civil society, where they stand on an international or regional scale, are they fundamental or are they just um, uh, something that reduces their effectiveness. Thank you. So Raj, Rajdeep, so do you um, have anything would like to respond to William? Sure. Uh, look, I, as I said, I think this is an issue which needs greater focus. I don't think we focus enough on the role of civil society in adding, uh, you know, in almost giving us ammunition in a way to protect me media freedom and values of democracy. And I think what's happened, and I come back to it, because society has got so polarized in, 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 in recent times, and because the propaganda is so shrill and strident, uh, you're being forced to take sides. We are living increasingly in them versus us times. So today as a journalist, if in India, uh, someone like me is arrested or uh, is charged by the government of the day, the government supporters will say he deserved it. You know, they will be cheerleading. <laughs> Uh, and I don't think that would have happened 20, 25 years ago. That's the difference. I think 25 years ago, civil society had a certain, should I say, a broad consensus on values that needed to be protected at all costs. That consensus has broken down. I think the polarization of society has meant that you're pushing society and, and sort of pigeonholing people. You're a left liberal, you're a right wing Sanghi, Sanghi referring to the RSS. And, and you know, you end up polarizing the media. It, it happens in newsrooms. You know, I don't think newsrooms anymore reflect those democratic values anymore. This particular anchor is, is linked to the ruling party. This particular anchor is linked to the opposition. And, and you actually have, uh, uh, because of the, of the sort of uh, creeping or vaulting intolerance and a polarized society, the capacity of civil society to resist has, has dwindled. But you ask, on an overall scale where I would locate India. I think the one thing that rescues India and I think separates India, if I may be allowed to say so, I know I hesitate at South Asia gatherings to ever take the high moral ground about India, is it's India's pluralism. We still, for all our infirmities, remain a remarkably plural society. You know, just the sheer size, the subcontinental size of India means that you will always have 
various opinions expressed particularly from the periphery which sooner or later do come and reflect uh, in in some manner or the other so i think that is a hope maybe i'm maybe i'm clinging on to it i heard uh, uh, mr thusudaya suggest that you know look at newspapers they are critical they they write critical commentary of the prime minister every now and then they do but it doesn't influence but it's not the dominant narrative the dominant narrative is still what i call headline management you know we just experienced my you know uh, 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 look at the way governments of the day not just at the center but even in the states are able to monopolize the narrative because they have the capacity to do so but i think the one thing that possibly will rescue civil society will force civil society to speak up more is the sheer pluralism of india and the one thing that will not is the weakening of institutions i think one thing 20 years ago or 10 years ago also if we had this discussion that i would have taken pride in was the strength of our institutions and i refer here to the supreme court i i i, I refer here to the uh, to the legislatures uh, all of them have weakened beyond measure and they've been weakening before our eyes and when you weaken when 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 the judiciary in particular weakens and becomes what one legal scholar now calls an executive court then as a journalist who do i turn to if i am charged with sedition tomorrow for my views i expect the court to protect me but there are instances in recent times where courts have chosen not to fulfill their duties and if that doesn't happen that's so my hope is that somewhere uh, you know the the sheer diversity of opinion will push our system into sort of forcing uh, the institutions to recognize their mandated role and and therefore i remain quietly optimistic that we will eventually find in a way a moral compass we don't find it at the moment but i do believe that in the future we will but a few articles here and there do not reflect to my mind the nature of the media i think you know that's you know they and that's what the government says you know they this is the oh but we allow this this editorial i mean one editorial in an indian express or one program on india today is not the indian media it's the you know please appreciate look at the way the hindi regional media in particular is is, is it simply is an echo chamber for for government opinion look at the way the opinion uh, opposition has been invisibilized in india how do you expect a uh, a level playing field in the in 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 an election in india when the opposition gets invisibilized and this happens at the state level so it's not just one party it's who whichever party is in power in fact i believe the modi model is now a model which is simply being copied by state governments as well so i think i think we need to be very cautious before we you use the odd article or the odd program to suggest no no the indian media is free let's let's call a spade a spade the indian media at the moment is facing a crisis of credibility and a crisis of 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 how free is it really can we uh, one point that you've already mentioned i'd like to put uh, to all the speakers is how much of a problem is it that politicians like ms modi um now feel they don't even need the media they go straight yes. uh, to social media address them directly and does that also make it difficult for you to attract uh top level politicians opinions and be the main conduit between the politicians and the public and uh, najam has this is that affecting you at all uh yes and no i think uh, in our situation yes it's true almost a, 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 every politician of repute has this, as a social has a, a twitter handle and a facebook page and so they're at it all the time uh, that's absolutely the case including the prime minister um and but i think there's something else happening in our situation which is that we have like about 100 tv channels of which at least 30 are news channels and 30 or maybe even more um and every evening all the mainstream politicians and mainstream political parties are on television representing their point of view sitting across the table um, with with anchors um so that point of view is coming across both on social media and on the electronic media not so much in the print media which tends to be a little more independent and varied uh, but yes that is happening but if i can just go back and pick up a point uh, that needs to be stressed from our uh, po uh, point of view uh, rajdeep mentioned uh, uh, sedition the lodging of cases of sedition um, uh, as a means to manage or control the media well i don't know the extent to which this is prevalent 
different in India, but in Pakistan, this is becoming quite common practice now. Uh, the old laws have been dug up, and every second journalist is now being slapped with the case of sedition. Now, you know, um, uh, but that is the common element with India. What is happening in our case also is that, unfortunately, everything is now becoming a case of blasphemy. Uh, anything can be twisted to imply that you've blasphemed in some way or the other. Now, that is far more dangerous than anything. You, you get accused of blasphemy, you can't live in the country. You literally have to leave the country. And what is now happening is that accusations of blasphemy are being traded uh, for little or no relevant reason. And that is very dangerous. I'll give you one example. I, was, I said something on, on a TV program about institutional corruptions. I was slapped with 17 cases of sedition by unknown people across Pakistan. In the remote corners of Pakistan, in police stations, uh, police reports were lodged saying, I'm a traitor. I've uh, uh, brought uh, certain institutions into disrepute by talking about institutional corruption. <clears throat> this is a non-bailable offense, meaning that you have to apply for bail if you don't want to get arrested. Um, I refuse to apply for bail because running around across the length and breadth of the country to get bail. And God knows in certain, some remote area, somebody might take a pot shot at you. I said, I'm not going to apply for bail. You want to arrest me? Come and get me. And then uh, um, there was an attempt to arrest me. As it so happened, I wasn't there. Uh, I was out of the country at that time. But they can come and arrest me at any time. And the fact that they haven't done so probably thinks they've done a cost-benefit analysis and, and thought, okay, there's no point, and the threat is good enough. But a lot of journalists are facing this, and they have to run to the courts. Even if, there's a, even if, they, if a hearing is scheduled, they have to go there. It is the most acute form of harassment that I can now think of. But on top of that, what happens is that occasionally, um, groups of people will go on the rampage holding placards, accusing me or somebody else by name and saying, uh, you're a traitor, you're an Indian agent, or you've blasphemed, uh, <clears throat> or you've called such, or you've held such and such an institution in disrespect, and that action should be taken against you, and these things can tend to get violent. Um, so this is a, a phenomenon that we now face in Pakistan, that sedition on a large scale, cases of sedition, harassment, pure and simple harassment. Uh, can you imagine if there were 17 cases of uh, sedition lodged across the length and breadth of Pakistan, all year round you'd be traveling to one or the other for a hearing and nothing would happen, you'd just go there and uh, the judge wouldn't come, but you still have to go there. <clears throat> and uh, even to get bail, you have to go to that particular court at which the uh, uh, FIR has been lodged. I mean, I tried very hard to get the high court to grant me bail and the high court said, no, you have to go to X, Y, Z place in some remote area of Pakistan where the case has been lodged. So, I mean, the sedition, blasphemy, these are the new threats that we face. I, well, I, I just have... wanted to, I just wanted to add uh, just very quickly to what Najam said, uh, you know, uh, along, uh, blasphemy, I know, is a huge challenge in Pakistan, as I said, sedition in India. And along with that, and this is where maybe the Commonwealth, uh, a group like the Commonwealth can play a role, is a criminal defamation increasingly criminal defamation is used. I mean, the very idea across the world in, in most liberal democracies, criminal uh, defamation is no longer criminalized. And I think if uh, groups like uh, the Commonwealth, uh, uh, you know, uh, media initiative can come together, perhaps uh, put together a petition, get, uh, you know, uh, well-meaning lawyers to come together to at least work towards striking off criminal defamation of our statute books, these are again colonial laws which have been sort of, uh, you know, Britain itself has, has struck it off their statute books. Why can't we do it in India? And I, you know, it is an extreme form of harassment. Some of us have gone through it. We have to go to the courts month after month. The judge doesn't come and the matter lingers on for years. I mean, these are the little areas where I think if we can sort of score small victories uh, or what I call small victories, you know, it, it, it would be hugely beneficial uh, to journalists and, and give them a sense that, you know, maybe things are turning around the corner. Rita, can I just, a um, little interjection? Uh, yeah. Not on, not on the, the legal aspect we covered. Uh -huh. I, I just wanted to mention something uh, in relation to this kind of othering process which is happening in the media, in India, um, which is then reflecting a kind of sociological, political shift, I would say even psychological shift um, 
And for example, in the 2019 elections, for the first time in independent India's history, there was not a single Muslim candidate in the Lok Sabha, the Lower House of Parliament uh, from UP, which is the center of not in Indian Islam, but South Asian Islam, which is the place where Bareilly <coughs> is located, where Deoband is located, where Aligarh is located. And there is no representation from that state in the national. There's level. one, just one. Who? Uh, Danish Ali from the BSP. He's the oh, only okay. MP. He's the uh, only out of 80, but you're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, I, thought, and, okay, and, I stand corrected. But, no, even, but, but, but the truth is, the truth is in every assembly, in every assembly election, and I'm getting this checked in the last three years, uh, the representation of Muslims has declined. Please go declined. ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, so it's not just that, that's, that's the kind of political situation that a state where nearly 20% population is Muslim and it has all this history behind it. There is, I stand corrected, it's one person there <laughs> in the parliament. Uh, you know, and, and that's, as Rajdeep said, this is a reflection of what else is happening politically across the country. But more worryingly in the media uh, space, uh, there is a concerted effort to demonize um, Muslims and we can't just, you know, talk around it. It's, it's as crude as is possible, uh, in, in, uh, possibly allowed in a, in a democratic net, net discussion. Uh, so we heard, for example, when the corona uh, was, uh, you know, beginning to affect India, there was this whole idea of corona jihad. That this is a this is a conspiracy mm. by certain right. group of Muslims who are trying to spread it across the country. Um, so. It, that is something which worries me uh, at a much more deeper level. Well, I think that's something I would like to ask uh, Rajiv, because how much control do you still have of what you put out, Rajiv? For example, this very issue uh, that Dyer has highlighted, the demonization of others and minorities. Are you able to balance it in any way in your work? Yeah. And other uh, other personalities like you, journalists, senior journalists, able to try and redress the balance somehow? You know, let, let me be honest again. And I think that's a very important point that there has raised. Today at 10 o'clock in the night, I'm doing a program on this new concept called love jihad. Uh, the idea that an interfaith marriage could possibly be a marriage done under the uh, forcibly involved forcible conversion and must be seen and must be criminalized. Now, I'm going to obviously question the whole basis of love jihad, the criminalization of interfaith marriage. But guess what? There will be a couple of programs, I'm sure done, possibly on my network or another network, maybe in the regional language, which will have voices which will endorse it strongly. So, you know, in the interest of a so-called democratic newsroom, we forget the values that underlie uh, the society. So you will have shrill polarized voices uh, speaking out and saying, of course, there is love jihad. And there are, you know, uh, uh, the Muslims are converting Hindu women possibly. And that narrative will perhaps take over from my little half an hour program that I'll do in English. Because at the end of the day, and this is the pro uh, point, you know, uh, the uh, a Hindi viewership, a Hindi language viewership is a hundred times more than an English language viewership. A regional language viewership is even larger. Now, if in those languages, on, under the guise or pretext that you are more rooted and you're speaking the language of the people, you endorse the othering or you endorse these kind of concepts. And Corona Jihad was the same thing happened. You know, I might have done a program questioning the basis of how can you sort of demonize an entire community based on what might have happened in one particular event, a so-called super spreader event. But there were numerous others who probably outshouted me uh, uh, you know, who were able to send out the message, no, the Tabliki Jamaat is responsible for, for Corona. So I think that's the problem that, you know, majoritarianism has got so, has seeped into the, uh, into the newsroom, if I may be allowed to say so, to an extent where I will po possibly be a sort of lone voice in the wilderness. So while I will reflect perhaps what I think are the core values of our constitution, there are others who believe majoritarianism is the voice of the people today. So my fear is that we'll see more, not less of this. And I think that's a real critical point again, which needs to be looked at the stereotyping of communities and the other name. Well, so this is now, we were also hoping to look at examples of good practice. Yeah. So we've seen it all looks pretty negative. So can you give us any crumbs of hope? I know Rajiv, you did say that you felt there was a glimmer of hope, you detected little glimmers of hope. Um, 
so what do you think, Najam? Is there anything in this scenario you feel that one can turn things? Is there, <clears> you know, <throat> can popular programs, one popular program, you know, try and explain, get the balance, say, what does South Asia have to gain from constantly this India, Pakistan getting at each other? Is, would there be an audience for that? I don't think there's an audience or a dialogue between India and Pakistan yeah, right now, as things stand, frankly. Um, um, but I will say one thing about Pakistan. You asked about civil society. Uh, Rajdeep is absolutely right. The old forms of civil society resistance are now being replaced by uh, new forms. The old forms were human rights societies, journalist protection societies, and so on. What you now have is something very interesting in Pakistan. I don't, I'm not sure it exists in India. Uh, the lawyers. We have, we've had what we call a lawyers movement for the restoration of democracy. This was for the independence of the judiciary from about 10 years ago. Um, and since then, the lawyers as a socioeconomic group, uh, as a category, uh, the lawyers, um, big and small, and lawyers' organizations, bar associations, etc., have become a very strong voice for civil society and for democracy. This is a very interesting development in Pakistan because uh, this obviously impinges on the bench as well. But the interesting thing on the other side is that, as Rajdi points out, the bench has become far more subservient to the state and the organs of the state than ever before. That's the other side of the coin. We cannot expect the bench to respond to media problems as they used to in the old days, as the fourth pillar that they had to protect. No, no, it's not protecting the fourth pillar. So that has gone. But on the other side, you have the lawyers uh, who are coming out in defense of petitions for, to defend various civil society rights. The second thing is, there's a new phenomenon, uh, at least for Pakistan. It, it exists to a very great extent in India, but not hitherto not in Pakistan. And that is women's groups, activists, mm -hmm. young people uh, out on the streets demanding women's rights, uh, anti-harassment, uh, and you know, Me Too, all the rest of it, and, uh, and, and getting a lot of media space uh, in terms of the demands that they're uh, voicing. That's another interesting development. And the third thing is that we in Pakistan had stopped thinking in leftist terms. Uh, the left movements, post-partition left movements, all ended up uh, uh, drying up by the 1970s. And then we had two stints of martial law and so on. And so the left actually dried up. And you, the, the space of the left was taken up by the lib labs. Uh, but now what is happening is there's a revival um, uh, of leftist thinking in the younger generation of men and women. Um, it's very uh, preliminary right now, but it's definitely there. There is a, a new social society groups are coming up, trade union uh, organizations run by leftists, educated leftists. Uh, so there's a revival of ide ideological politics uh, in opposition to the, uh, pop the, the politics of the majority or the, uh, po uh, the popular politics of populism. So those are the two new, the women's groups and the leftist groups groups. And the third element in Pakistan is sub-nationalism. Sub-nationalist groups in the periphery of Pakistan, uh, which have faced the onslaught of terrorism and uh, cross-border uh, violence uh, and state action uh, to put those down. Uh, and with all that it implies in terms of backlashes, uh, these groups have also become part of civil society. And so, all, so, 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 so when, when there is a civil society issue, uh, all of these three groups or four groups tend to get together and voice similar concerns. The tragedy is that they're not allowed to do this on the mainstream media, uh, possibly a little bit in the English print media, uh, but, uh, but none in the Urdu media uh, and none whatsoever in the electronic uh, media. So they're all on, on, on YouTube or they're on social media, but they're a very powerful voice to influence events. Well, I think um, we need to. And I want to add. Uh, and I want to add stand-up comedians. <laughs> <laughs> Ex well, it's true. But then well, we yes, are yes. to operate without insulting somebody. No, yeah. I'm, I, I'm finding on the internet. You know, uh, just as a sort of positive note, you're yeah. you're getting a lot of these internet uh, uh, YouTubers uh, who are attracting right. large crowds among the young uh, of India, cutting across 
Hindi, English, cutting across sort of, uh, you know, middle class, upper class. And I think maybe, maybe the young are the future. You know, maybe there's a younger uh, 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 India, which doesn't want to be talked down to by anyone, which simply wants a new language, a new vocabulary, possibly. And of course, I think when we talk about the media, um, it's changed. It's not just one media anymore. And, you know, the traditional mainstream media, I mean, a lot of, as you say, young people get their news from elsewhere. That's not a source. That's so, right. so what, again, I, as you see, maybe we can work on that. That would be a, a, um, something to look at. So looking at the future now, as we sort of near the <laughs> end of our time, I just, I'll just interrupt very briefly because uh, David Page um, has been able to speak uh, to someone in uh, Sri Lanka who is unfortunately not able to join the panel. So I thought we'd take advantage of this opportunity to get David because he's spoken to her and she's relayed some points to him. So David, can you talk about Sri Lanka, please, before we close? Um, before he yes. does, can I, I I'm going to have yes. to leave. Uh, is that okay, Rita? Because of someone, course, someone... of course. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, thank I've, you. I've got all the thank points you started with. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, thank you very, very much. much. Yeah. Thank you very and much. Thank good you. luck. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, if I could just say, having spoken to you, Charlie, I mean, I think she feels that, um, you know, in Sri Lanka, where this 20th Amendment was brought in by the uh, the uh, Rajapaksha government, 20th Amendment um, is now passed through Parliament, and of course it does enormously restore the powers of the President and reduces the the um, the, the constraints that were there before. But she makes the point, I think, that uh, in Sri Lanka there was there was a, a huge amount of opposition to this, not just from traditional civil society groups, but also from from judges, for example, from auditors, because a lot of the um, the previous um, parliamentary groups and commissions that were uh, having their powers taken away, they responded to it. And even Buddhist monks have, have, have come out, Buddhist monks that have been very strongly in favor, really, of of the uh, the Rajapaksha um, uh, ideology and line on, on the, the civil war have come out uh, making points about democracy. So she feels that um, though the 20th Amendment has um, given a great deal of uh, power to the president, which was not there before, uh, the president himself is aware that, you know, there is a lot of pressure coming from civil society, that, uh, that uh, civil society's um, view should be respected. And in fact, he has recently um, made appointments to the judiciary which, in fact, have gone entirely on the basis of seniority. So um, she sees this as um, a sign that he's aware of this pressure. But of course, the power is there, and the power can be used in future, and that's obviously a worry. Uh, Kishali herself is um, a commissioner representing the press and the media on the Sri Lanka um, Human Rights Commission, and that was, of course, one of the major progressive pieces of legislation brought in uh, by the 2015 government. Uh, and uh, that so far has not been touched. I mean, government has said that it is going to allow it to continue to um, operate. Um, so that is that is a positive sign. On the on the, the status of journalists generally, I mean, under the emergency laws that are obtained during the civil war, of course. The government was using, um, you know, uh, using uh, the, the, the emergency powers to, 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 to control journalism. Now, she says that, of course, is not an option because those powers have been rescinded. But they are now using something called the ICCPR Act. This is a, a Sri Lankan Act brought in in 2007, which incorporated some of the um, provisions of the, um, the International uh, uh, Act. Um, on 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 uh, the rights of journalists and freedom of expression, but that is actually now being used uh, against journalists who who um, uh, are accused of inflaming uh, racial or communal tension, and, and and she sees that as a and being used quite indiscriminately. So that is that is a, a worry for the future. Um, I think those were the main points, really. Thank you very much. Um, as we're reaching the end of our discussion. Um, I'm just going to the main point, I think, which all of you had in common, what Rajid had set, set out at the beginning, the rise of elected autocrats, collapse of the business model, 
enfeebling of institutions, polarization of society. Out of all these elements, um, Najam and Daya, do, can you think of any ways that the media can counter this or deal with this? So first of all, rise of elected autocrats, where they're crushing dissent. Anything you can think of after the discussion today, um, Najam? I think if there's any hope, it's in social media. I don't hold out any hope from the electronic media. <clears throat> um, they're under enormous pressure, uh, partly from lack of business and then, of course, various government laws to shut them down and the huge investments that there are there. Um, I'm not optimistic about uh, uh, getting justice from, from where we should get justice from the ju judiciary. Uh, it's also under enormous pressure. Same pressure, majoritarianism. It's interesting, the current uh, regime, I dare say, I mean, I'm going to, this is a leap of imagination on my part. I dare say that every family in Pakistan with any links to the military or to the judiciary or to the bureaucracy, i.e. the organs of the state, most family members have voted for this government. Um, and they're not likely to give relief to any uh, to those uh, who are on the outside right now, you know, regardless of the fact that perhaps uh, the majority vote didn't go to the government in power. So I think um, it's a bleak outlook right now, uh, but uh, not all is lost. Social media continues to be a pain in the neck uh, for those who would want to control the media. And um, not all the laws in the world uh, will stop young idealistic people uh, from expressing their thoughts and banding together to, to resist. Um, Daya, do you have any thoughts on funding? Because obviously we've heard about the concentration of media ownership and they are turned close to the governments and authorities. So do you, do you know of any funding models that might work? <clears throat> Alternate views of funding the media? If, if I knew, I would be a very rich man. I would be <laughs> teaching in a university. Um, uh, you know, but there are models, for example, within India, there are small organizations like News Laundry, which is part of, used to be part of India Today Group. And they have subscription based service. You, you, there are no advertisements. But of course, it's, these are marginal groups and they are talking to the converted. I think the bigger picture is, as, as Najam said, what's going to happen to social media. If you just think of the whole region, India at the moment has about 700 million people online, which means 600 million are not online. In Pakistan, the figure is much, I mean, the percentage of people who are online is much small. In fact, the, the, the uh, smallest in, uh, in comparison to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, etc. cetera. Um, so in the next 10 years, maybe sooner, given the, uh, very interesting convergence happening between uh, big corporates, uh, in India's case, Mr. Reliance, uh, Mr. Abani, who owns uh, effectively India's internet infrastructure, and Geo is already has like 400 million people in less than three years or four years. This is extraordinary. Um, and he also happens to own the largest television network in India, uh, which is TV18, with various uh, regional channels, and, it, and he's very close to the current dispensation in Delhi. So I think that convergence is going to give the Indian internet a kind of infrastructure, indigenous infrastructure, which is the largest internet, open internet in the world uh, deserves. And I think there's already a lot of debate going on about data localization, about cyber sovereignty, not on the Chinese model, but also not on the, uh, the US model. So there's a kind of hybrid model drawing on what's, what is being discussed in Brussels, for example. And I think that offers an interesting uh, possibility because everything is moving in that direction anyway. And how that space uh, you know, shapes up in terms of uh, freedom uh, of, of opinion and how that can be uh, you know, uh, used to at least broaden the public sphere um, is, is what gives me hope because I do think uh, and I think this is a very fundamental pro point, which we often, especially in the West, do not take into account, which is that Indian thought is not binary. It is not a Brahminical tradition. We are with us or you are against us. You are both. And that is what makes it an interesting discourse. And I think that is not going to go away. If anything, it is going to become more strong and uh, is going to be an important uh, kind of corrective to the dominant 
intellectual discourses that have shaped India, and you know whether it's Macaulay or Marx, and or market. Now there has to be a, th a fourth M, and I think people are working on that. That will take some time. So I, I'm so I'm optimistic. Yeah. Before I invite uh, Philip to close this particular session, Najam, is there anything burning? One last message you want to put out that you're burning to say and have had, haven't had a chance to say. Well, you know, from as from Pakistan's perspective. Um, most of us who face persecution uh, at home or controls at home have perforce had to look outside Pakistan for sustenance and support, especially in terms of our human rights. And I hope uh, that uh, with the arrival of Joe Biden, uh, the American human rights agenda uh, will be strong because that is a strong voice for protection of minorities and uh, uh, underprivileged groups and especially endangered species like an independent media. Well, thank you. Um, it's well, I've learned a lot and I'm hoping that everybody else has found it stimulating. It's um, I'm sorry that I have not been able to include all the questions that have come in, but um, I think mm -hmm. we covered a lot of ground and a lot of issues that um, that needed to be addressed. Um, so thank you from on my behalf. And now I'll invite Philip to say a few words. Well, th thank you, Rita, so much for chairing so expertly and for a really wonderful panel. And and, and, and sort of amazingly, Naja managed to end on a on a bright note, um, which is, uh, is is always refreshing. Um, it's been a it's been a wonderfully rich discussion. And again, I'm so pleased we were able to to record these. I'm sure there'll be a tremendous interest uh, to to people around the world. Um, Thank you all so much. We're going to take a break now. Uh, in in the UK, it's lunchtime, um, so um, we uh, we have some lunch, and then we return in about an hour and a half uh, at two o'clock London time uh, for the panel on Africa. So I hope I'll see you then. And uh, again, thank you all so much.